Welcome back to Progressive Christian Ministry Training. We continue to look at examples from Scripture and history of individuals who felt God's call. And we've been looking at those whose calling came out of who they are and discussing how that shows us that the way God has uniquely shaped you and your personality your natural abilities, your experiences, even the way God has shaped you in the instances of your birth, how they can all be signs to what God has called you to do. Last time we concluded by looking at the example of Mary Magdalene and how her experience as a person who seemed to have been struggling with some sort of mental illness and experience of likely abuse and rejection, had uniquely shaped her to be able to become the apostle to the apostles, the first witness of Jesus' resurrection, and what a powerful ministry she had. On the other side of the equation, there are many aspects of who we are that is coming from that are coming from how we are born. To quote Lady Gaga, no matter gay, straight, or bi, lesbian, transgender life, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to survive. No matter black, white, or beige, cola, or orient made, I'm on the right track, baby. I was born to be brave. I'm beautiful in my way because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. And to me, the, the perfect picture of what Lady Gaga is seeing about, the way in which we're all made by God, not as a mistake, but with a, a purpose and a plan and a calling, just as we're made, is John the Baptizer. And it may seem kind of strange to connect John the Baptizer with Lady Gaga, but Lady Gaga is singing about the circumstances of our birth and how they're not mistakes and none of us are throwaways. And it is precisely the circumstances of his birth that is a, gives us the first glimmerings of what John the Baptizer is called to do. Because in the book of Luke, he is depicted as having a calling that begins while he is a child. In fact, while he is in the womb, he is described as having the Holy Spirit at work calling him. There's a beautiful scene, in fact, in the Gospel of Luke where his mother Elizabeth and Jesus' mother Mary encounter each other, and John the Baptist is filled with the Spirit and jumps in Elizabeth's womb. I, I uh, uh, what an amazing kind of beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit already beginning to work in John the Baptist and call him right there in those circumstances of how he's going to be born. And too often people live as if the way they are born is a mistake, as if because they are born as a man or, or, or a woman or transgendered, because they are born as gay or straight or bi, um, because they're born with a disability that others see, or in this culture or that, that those circumstances of their birth, too often people live as if that's an obstacle, as if that holds them back from what God has called them to do. When in fact, John the Baptist is showing us, in his example here, that how you are born is not an accident, but even in that, God is working to lay in your life gifts that when you embrace them can become a part of your calling. And we're going to see that in some examples in a moment. Now we've talked about some biblical examples, but there are two examples I would like to mention to you uh, from Christian history. The first of these is Joni Erickson Tata. Joni Erickson Tata as a young lady, very athletic, active, involved, kind of a social butterfly of a person, as a young lady, she has an accident that turns her into a quadriplegic. And if you can imagine what it's like to go from being able-bodied and athletic and involved in a social butterfly to suddenly having to figure out how to live life as quadriplegic because of an accident. You can imagine what it was like for her and why she followed that experience by going through bouts of deep depression. But as she prayed and began to find God's presence in this, she works her way through her time of depression and begins to find life again. One of the things that she learned to do that becomes for her a sign of, of embracing the life she has is to paint. She didn't use her hands, she can't use her feet, but she can use her mouth. And she paints using her mouth 
And there's a picture of her doing that here. But she begins to learn that she can have a full life with a disability. And out of that grows her ministry. And it's not despite her disability, but precisely because of her experience as a person with a disability and a person struggling with depression, that Joni Erickson Tata begins to craft a ministry that advocates for people with disabilities. She began to do programs that helped people with disabilities in the church and in the community. In fact, I think she still has a program where she gets churches to send uh, wheelchairs and other medical equipment overseas in areas with, without a lot of medical care to help people with disabilities have a, a more meaningful life. But she didn't just focus on that. She also became a speaker and an author and an artist and a radio personality. And in her speaking and writing, she would use her experience to reach out to people who maybe they weren't struggling with a disability, but they were struggling, who had those, that deep depression, that deep pain, and, and, and to help them find God in their situation. And her experience of depression and disability is exactly the, the, what wakens, uh, wakes her up to her calling. And I think that's true for many people, that those experiences of who they are in the midst of those circumstances, call them to their ministry. Um, a final example from history I want to mention is uh, the recent example of Reverend Troy Perry. Troy Perry um, began his ministries in the 50s and 60s, and he began as a Church of God preacher. But what was unknown to everyone but Troy was that he was struggling with hiding same-gender attraction. He was a gay man in a time, in a society, in a church where there was no place for gay men. So he did what was expected of him, and he married, and he had children, but he never had that spark in his heart and in his life for his wife that he felt toward men in his life. And, you know, like any secret that is pushed down, this eventually came out in the light of day. When his wife discovered that he was gay, she left him and, and, and brought the kids. So he lost his wife, he left, lost his marriage, he lost his children. And the church, of course, threw him out and took away his ministry credentials. So he was without a family, without a job, no longer a pastor, no longer with a church. I mean, that's a pretty hard experience to go to. And this begins a downward, downward spiral for Troy that eventually leads him to, to take, try to take his own life out of despair over how his life has turned out and loathing for his own sexuality. Troy's attempt to slit his own wrist doesn't kill him, which was Troy's goal, but instead God had another plan. And his roommate comes home and finds him laying in the tub with slit wrists and takes him to the hospital. And while he recovers there from his suicide attempt, Troy has one of those spiritual experiences we talked about before, where he feels God speak to him, telling him that, that, Troy, I love you. I love you not despite the fact that you're gay, but precisely because of who you are. And when he really begins to realize that he is loved precisely because of who he is, this awakens in Troy a desire to reach out to people like him, who because of those accidents of their birth, because they are gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgendered, have experienced being cast out of the church and told that they are not welcome. To reach out to them and draw them into a living relationship with God. And out of this experience, Troy begins the first church that openly welcomes gay couples and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people. And he founds, without meaning it, a denomination, because a movement of churches start that each have that purpose throughout the world, the universal fellowship of the metropolitan community churches. And in fact, many progressive churches could say that they are continuing this example of Troy Perry, because though they may not be a part of the MCC movement, they are part of the wider welcoming and affirming movement that is saying, no, we can never say someone is not welcome in God's church. And, and God loves all people. 